All right. Well, I think we're live now. Do you hear me all right, Tim? I can. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'm Kelsey Timmerman. I'm joined today by Tim McCollum, one of the co-founders of Ma De Cas Chocolate, um, which makes bean-to-bar chocolate just solely in Madagascar. It's grown, it's produced all in Madagascar, and it's sold all across the United States. So welcome, Tim. Thanks for having me, Kelsey. So we're just going to have a conversation back and forth. I went to uh, West Africa to research where chocolate comes from. Um, from the countries of Ivory Coast, Ghana, and Burkina Faso. So Tim and I are just going to have a conversation. You guys are welcome to you know, ask us questions as we're going. I think that they'll pop up somewhere. If they don't, we won't answer them. Um, and so Tim might have some questions for me. I have some questions for him. But first, to kick things off, Tim, could you just tell me a little bit uh, about your company? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's As far as chocolate companies go, it's relatively small. Um, but what we're doing in the world is pretty different than what other chocolate companies do. So we make chocolate start to finish or bean to bar in Madagascar, which is this big island off the coast of Africa. And um, I think there are two things that we usually tell people when they're interested about our chocolate. The first is the chocolate itself is made from some of the last genetically pure cocoa left in the world. It's got a very interesting fruity taste to it. Second thing is that the chocolate is made start to finish in Madagascar. And um, the reason we do that is by including every step of the value chain, or by doing every step of the value chain in Madagascar itself, we're able to have a bigger social impact on more communities up and down the island. But then had we just exported the raw cocoa beans to begin with. So how long have there been cacao trees in Madagascar, because originally kind of cacao came from uh, South America over to Africa. Is that the kind of journey it was? Yeah, um, cocoa left or started to arrive in Madagascar in the early 1900s, okay. um, and probably mainland Africa a little bit before that. Um, but cocoa is original uh, to Latin America. That's where it first grew naturally and then over time what's happened is the majority of the world's crop made its way to Africa and proliferated there and today Africa produces about 65 percent of the world's cocoa. Okay. I think I'm, I'm froze up a little bit or Tim. Can you hear me now Tim? I can and you know you broke up a couple times too. Okay. Alright well if it gets too bad just let me know and we can you know start over or something like that. Okay. Um, so, I mean, how do you, uh, like, where, where are you originally from? You're from Ohio? Is that, are you a family uh, in Ohio? I grew up in New Jersey, and then I, I spent my college years in Ohio. Um, so, of course, your high school guidance counselor said, you know, go be a cocoa <laughs> entrepreneur, right? Um, yeah, that's what my parents told me when I was, like, three, um, and everybody since then. No, I was like, um, you know, it's the way life works, but you very seldomly know what you're going to be doing when you're younger. And this is about the last thing I would, ever would have dreamt up. So what was that path like? You graduate high school, you go to college, you major in something. What, what, what was that? Yeah. Um, pretty traditional upbringing, um, kind of middle class U.S. And although I was in New Jersey, I felt more like a Midwestern upbringing, very small town. We went to college in Ohio and was always attracted to history. So I was a history major. And um, when it came time, you know, towards your junior year in college, you start thinking about what you want to do with your life. And I had no idea. So I thought, why don't I go in the Peace Corps? Because I was introduced to the Peace Corps back in high school. I knew someone that had uh, actually served in West Africa. And I thought that would be the perfect opportunity to do something very impactful, to do some travel, but to really get out in the world and start to understand um, how people in other countries live and work. So then you were placed in Madagascar. You don't choose where you go in the Peace Corps. You just got placed in Madagascar. And then what was your focus there? What was your project or what was your mission? Yeah. Yeah, correct. Um, you don't get to choose where you go. 
you just go where they tell you. Um, you can vaguely say, I want to go to Africa or Latin America. But when it comes down to the specific country, it's, um, it's uh, kind of a crapshoot. So I went to Madagascar and um, was an English teacher. And that meant I spent most of my time in this crammed little classroom with 100, um, 100 first graders huddled around trying to teach them how to say very basic phrases in English. And obviously, it's, Madagascar is one of the poorest countries in the world, so the school system itself is unlike anything you would, you know, you could imagine what a school system is like. Okay, I'm going to have to take a time out. So 100 first graders and, and just one teacher. Yeah. Like, were you able, did you feel like, like, did you have days where you, a week so you just accomplished nothing, or do you feel like that was... Like what? What was that like? Like what was the setting of that classroom? Was it just complete chaos, or did you have, like rule with a firm fist? Yeah. It it was actually um, it was two years where it goes by and you're like, wow, what did I accomplish? Because if you look at it from one way, you realize it didn't really accomplish much. But if you were able to focus in on just a couple of students you realize you can make a difference. But the classroom itself is bare bones, no chalkboard. Um, students take a notebook and a piece of paper and a pencil and they write down everything you say and that becomes their textbook over the course of a year. So they don't have books, they don't have blackboards, there's real no methodology other than a teacher in the front of the room speaking and students writing. Um, it's completely inefficient and deficient. Um, and in, in terms of like reaching students, it's, it's a, you know very frustrating. But um, it also taught me how much local people there persevere. And by comparison, you know how lucky we are to, to grow up in a country like the U.S. and have an education educational system where it's 20 students to a teacher versus 100. Yeah, my daughter just started kindergarten. She's in there with 23 kindergartners. I just which I can't imagine that having having you know two kids at home is just you know yeah a really, uh, nightmare or something well, I don't say nightmare a blessing but whatever yeah um, so what about the experience kind of led you to want to go back to Madagascar and invest all this time and blood sweat and tears and resources into doing something more yeah. That's a good question. Um, you know, it comes down to a couple things. One is when you are a tourist or a visitor to a country and you see what real poverty is, it's, that's an experience. And then if you go there to actually live and work in the community, with the community for a couple of years, it's a totally different experience. And to me, that's not an experience you can easily get out of your body. Once it's like in your DNA, it's there to stay. Um, so I was really taken back by the community that I worked with. They were some of the poorest people in the world. On average, they live off of about a dollar a day. But whatever they had was mine. And they really opened up their community to me as an individual, even though they could barely conceptualize what the United States was or what the outside world was. And I think it was that feeling of being so welcome um, by people who were so poor and so different. Um, and I didn't realize it at the time, but I just want, I went back to the U.S. after that and, and knew at some point I wanted to do something to repay a lot of the people that had hosted me um, with something more significant than just teaching in their classrooms. I often write that um, when I travel to places, I've never been to Madagascar, but I've been to West Africa and Kenya and Ethiopia and, and Bangladesh and places like that. Um, I've written two books. One was about the garment industry, researched that in China and Bangladesh and Cambodia, and the other one was about food, uh, where am I eating, where I went to, Ivory Coast for cocoa, bananas in Costa Rica. So I, I, mean, I get to hang out with people all over the world. And what I write often is that they have a poverty of resources, but often a wealth of community, and then I come back home to Muncie, Indiana, where I'm sitting right now, or just the United States in general. I kind of see the reverse mm. of that, where we have a relative wealth of resources, but often the poverty of community. Was that kind of like your experience as well? Yeah, I saw I saw that, 
And I think it gets back to what I was saying earlier, where people could be very poor, but one, they don't view themselves as poor, and two, um, they're more generous with what little things they have than most people that I've met. And I think that speaks to what you're saying. It's more about a community, um, which is quite rich. And it, you know, another thing that I noticed, and this is throughout Africa, just how people treat family and Everyone in the U.S., like our culture, is you go to high school, you go to college, you go out on your own, and you typically move away from where you were raised. Um, in Madagascar, you typically wouldn't move outside of the village where you grew up, or if you did, you come back very frequently to visit. Um, a lot of their culture deals with like their ancestors and their family in a, a sense that makes you realize you don't need a whole lot to um, to be happy. Mm -hmm. So the students that you taught, like what kind of opportunities did, would they have as they progress on and what, what opportunities did their parents have? Yeah, not much is the answer. And I think the struggle is here in the U.S., it's a very easy message. People stay in school. Uh, because they expect that if they have a higher education, at some point they're going to be able to live a better life. It's a very easy, linear progression. In Africa, it's much different. Um, you could tell a student to stay in school, but they're not able to see that. They're not able to connect those dots in their head between education and, um, and a better life for themselves or for their family. So unfortunately, a lot of the people I taught um, picked up a couple of interesting words in English and got to spend, um, you know, a couple of years with the foreigner and had a good time, but they're not doing anything differently than what they would have done had the Peace Corps never taught English to them. And that was actually one of the problems that I, I went, I left Madagascar wanting to do something about, and it really comes down to there just not being jobs. And even saying there aren't jobs is hard for um, people like you or I to understand, but when I say that, I, I mean unemployment in Madagascar is 90%, as in 9-0. 10% of the country actually has a job that they go to on a, a daily basis. And I found it kind of heartbreaking that some of the students I taught were infinitely smarter than I was when I was their age. Infinitely smarter, maybe even more ambitious than I was but had absolutely no likelihood of ever using that education. And I can't say that when I left Madagascar after the Peace Corps, I knew exactly what I was going to do. I just knew I wanted to do something to, to really hit at the issue, um, something that was, a little, to me, a little more important than volunteering. So were you in a, um, um, a rural setting, or were you in a city in the Peace Corps? I was kind of between... Um, I was in what was called a regional town. There were about 10,000 people in the town. Um, definitely not a city. You know, there's no no access to electricity. Very little people in town have running water. Um, but it, it had a, a town of 10,000 people, which, by standard. Uh oh, I think we locked up there a little bit. Yeah, I think it, it got cut off. Yeah. So uh, you were talking about the size of the town, and then you were talking about the standards of that town. Yeah. It was a, a medium-sized town. There were about 10,000 people there, and um, very rural, by the way, we would think about it, but um, not totally out in the middle of nowhere. So were, were the, is it a farming community? Were there farmers, uh, children of farmers in your classes, that kind of thing? Yeah, it's safe to say that everyone in Madagascar is either a farmer or is one generation removed. Okay. Um, and in my town, although I was in a town, I was also on the coast, so a lot of people were fishermen. Mm -hmm. But almost everyone at some point has a little plot of land where they grow rice, they grow manioc, they grow uh, pineapples, whatever they can. It's subsistence farming is, is how you call it. So it wasn't really a cocoa region at all? No, my region where I lived was vanilla, um, so I knew a lot of vanilla farmers. Yeah. And the cocoa region is about 200 kilometers from where I, I worked and lived when I was there. So you got back from the Peace Corps and you wanted to, to make an impact 
uh, um, beyond that, and then how cocoa? Like, how did that? How why chocolate and vanilla? How did that happen? Yeah. Um, good question. It's kind of a roundabout story. So myself and the other co-founder of the business, we were in the Peace Corps together. After my two years, I was like, I got to get out of here. I want to go back to the U.S. and figure out. And um, so I went back to the U.S. and worked at American Express, which is a big company, obviously, and learned like sales and marketing fundamentals. I was there for six years. And then the other co-founder, Brett, stayed in Madagascar for four years. We got reunited. This would have been about six years after we each left Peace Corps and um, decided to start with vanilla because vanilla, um, Madagascar produces 65% of the world's vanilla. And it was only about a year after that that we started chocolate. And I remember one day we were looking at a value chain of a chocolate bar, which is just a, a graph that showed each stage of the chocolate bar production and how much value was being added to the chocolate bar. And I was shocked to realize that the cocoa was about 5% of the cost to produce a chocolate bar. Just yeah. 95% of that cost is all the other ingredients, the manufacturing, the processing, the packaging, and the transportation it takes to get the chocolate bar onto the shelf of the store. And when seeing that chart, seeing that value chain laid out in such clear terms to me, all I could focus on was that 5%. And that all the talk in the industry is fair trade cocoa, fair trade cocoa. And all the talk is only really addressing 5% of the chocolate bar. That if we really wanted to make a dent in the world, change the chocolate industry a little bit, we needed to address that other 95% of the value chain. And... Um, essentially why we started this. Yeah. Uh, the farmers I met um, in Ivory Coast, uh, so I, I, have you seen that viral video recently about the farmers chase, tasting chocolate for the first yeah. time? About, uh, that, was that your experience at all? Did you, I mean, had they tasted chocolate, the farmers that you first met, had they eaten chocolate before? Um, no, they haven't. I saw that video about 11, I think 11 people sent it to me or something. <laughs> I bet so. <laughs> I guess this is going around. Um, so yeah, they, our, they, our experiences, and we always go back when we visit the farmers. We'll bring them chocolate, so they understand what we're doing with the beans that we buy. Um, because it's uh, two things, right? One is cocoa farmers um, live in very hot climates where there isn't a lot of um, electricity, and not. Um, did, did we break up again? Nope, I got you. Okay, cool. Yeah, cocoa farmers live in very warm climates and tropical settings where there are no refrigeration, there's no um, temperature control around. So chocolate melts. So it's not like there's no chocolate within hundreds of miles of where farmers work. And secondly, even if there was chocolate, they wouldn't be able to afford it. Because the average chocolate bar, even locally, would be about 2 or $3.00. And to someone living off of one to two dollars a day, it's it's not an affordable um, item for them to buy. Yeah, the cocoa farmers I met in Ivory Coast, they had actually eaten chocolate before. I think there was something called was it Mambo chocolate. Like, it was horrible. Like I bought a bar of it. It was just it was just horrendous uh, chocolate. But we um, they told me what they got paid for their cocoa, and you know I don't know if their if their cocoa went into uh, her, um, Hershey's bar or not, but like what two thirds of the chocolate, uh, the cocoa in American chocolate comes from just the Ivory Coast. So mm -hmm. chances are, I mean, this is the kind of chocolate that goes in there. I think it's a way lesser quality of chocolate than what they have in Madagascar as well. Mm -hmm. But they um, earned one third of one penny for that, um, you know, Hershey, uh, for the Mount Cocoa and the Hershey milk chocolate bar. So you bought a, a Hershey milk chocolate bar. Like there is, you're handing one third of one cent to a farmer somewhere in Ivory Coast, maybe if it made it all the way back to them. So it's just kind of, yeah. kind of crazy. And and as you probably saw from your time there, it's a very labor-intensive crop. I mean, it includes climbing trees, um, pulling the fruit down, cutting the fruit in half, 
the fruit's pretty heavy. Um, there's a lot of labor that goes into that one third of one penny. And that's one of the probably unsustainable things about the industry as the industry works today. Well, I saw in West Africa, too, that the farmers were, the trees were getting old, the quality was going down, and they were starting to look to what else can we grow to better support our families, and some of them were switching to rubber trees and, and things like that, just getting away from it. And it seems to me like um, there's been a lot more talk recently from the big, you know, the big chocolate companies about going into this region and helping people out, and it's... And it seems like there's a bit more effort going into it now, and not just lip service. Um, but it seems like once the resource starts to become in jeopardy, then people are like, oh, whoa, farmers, hey, we want to help you out. We want to take care of you. Yeah. Um, was that ever the case in Madagascar? Or is there, I know that their chocolate's a much higher quality. Has it been a better situation than in West Africa? It is a little bit, but I, I think that dynamic you're talking about it applies to any anyone anywhere in the world, it doesn't matter where you're from. We've seen the act, the opposite because we're paying good prices to the farmers and it is higher quality. Um, so what we've seen is any, any cocoa farmer, they're going to have three or four different crops that they grow. They're going to grow cocoa, they're going to grow, if it's obviously tropical, they'll probably have coffee on their land, they'll probably have rice or manioc. And it's all subsistence farming, except for cocoa, which is usually cash crop. But maybe, um, I'll give you a couple of, of examples of farmers that we work with. Maybe they had planted 25% of their land with cocoa, and then we'll come in and give them a contract, and we'll set the price above market, and start realizing that they can make more, more money farming cocoa than they do rice. So they start to convert their rice to cocoa farms where they'll start to convert their manioc to cocoa and we've seen land over time be reforested with cocoa trees but it's all market driven and I think in Madagascar what you have is a higher quality cocoa farmers receiving more money and planting more cocoa trees which is probably the opposite of what's happening in West Africa because that's a, a really a commoditized crop and farmers get hit over the head by very large chocolate companies that want to keep those prices down. So the economics for, for farming cocoa just don't work out for, for the farmers. And like any human being, if you're going to get paid more to take a job across the street, you know, you'll know you likely go across the street. So I mean, that can almost present a, a whole other problem as well if you have everyone switching their land over to cocoa, which is something that they can't. I mean, you can eat it, but not really sustain yourself off of it. Um, I mean, do you have to encourage farmers to still kind of maintain some balance in what crops they're growing so they just don't take, stop growing food and just grow <laughs> cash crop? Yeah. Is that a concern? No, we haven't, we haven't seen that yet. I think partially because rice is the staple in Madagascar and it's, there's a lot of superstition and a lot of like deep-seated beliefs about rice and families will always grow their own rice. So they could plant cocoa. Um, but they'll always be planting their own rice somewhere off to the side. Okay. Um, so what? Talk about like a, a particular farmer or family that you've seen where they were before um, that you came in and started to work with them and pay a higher price for their their cocoa versus where they are now. Yeah. Yeah, we we've got tons of you know anecdotes and case studies. Um, there's one village in particular that's set up as a cooperative. Um, when we first started working with them, they had about 15 members in their cooperative. Now they have 20, uh, and usually the husband or the wife is the member, and the husband and the other wife work in the cooperative as well. So you could have 20 members with 40 workers. And we've taught them how to ferment and dry their own cocoa, which means they're going to get more value for the cocoa versus just selling the pod that comes off the tree. Um, so they're making about 60% more income than they were and we're very careful not to tell people what to do with their income and I think even going back to our our years in the Peace Corps and seeing a lot of traditional international development it's very common to see like the Americans come in and, and tell people how they should be spending their money mm -hmm. so you, 
we've been very careful not to do that. But we've seen them do things like invest in ox carts and cattle. And cattle is like the main mode of transportation. So instead of having to go into the forest and carry the, the cocoa on their heads, they can now transport it by ox cart. Mm -hmm. um, an ox in Madagascar is a sign of wealth. So mm -hmm. they've got a little more pride knowing that they own cattle and previously they didn't own cattle. Um, other people have chosen to put satellite dishes on their hut because they want to watch TV. And of course, you know, you can look at that and question is that progress? Um, when it's people who don't live without running water, but they want to have television. But I think the point we like to make is that's their choice. And now they have that choice, and, and they want to use a saddle, satellite dish or buy ox. That's their, that's their choice. We know they're also able to keep their kids in school a little bit longer. Um, the biggest barrier to school in Madagascar is not um, buildings and structures and teachers. The biggest barrier is um, the cost of entry. And for a student to go to school in, in Madagascar, they need to spend about four dollars on a notebook and some pens and, and pencils, and then about ten dollars a semester for tuition. But that fifteen dollars, which is you know pocket change to people here, um, to people living on the edge of poverty, it's enough to keep their kids out of school. So now that the farmers are making more money, they can they keep their children in school longer as well. And we've only been doing this um, for about four years, and we've seen some pretty good results. What gets us really excited is looking at how, how fast we're growing and the number of farmers that we're reaching and the ability to multiply that impact as our growth in the U.S. multiplies. Mm -hmm. So how many farmers are you impacting right now? We have 200 people uh, that we work with that are deriving their primary income from our operations. It's, those aren't all cocoa farmers. That also includes people that make our packaging. Our packaging is made locally. Some of the other ingredients we use, like the vanilla um, in the chocolate, and we have a product that has coffee beans in the chocolate. Um, those people could be farming coffee or vanilla as well. So I see like one of the big issues is, is that, that um, the fact that the cocoa farmers just aren't valued and aren't, aren't paid um, enough for their crop that they can send their kids to school. Um, that kind of gets hidden sometimes by this other issue in chocolate that always comes up of like the child labor involved in chocolate. Uh, and like to me, like I've grown up and as I've written stuff, you know, I grew up in a farming community and like farm kids work on farms and I'm sure a lot of the kids that aren't going to school are working on these farms as well. How do you see the child labor issue? Do you see that as this giant concern that everyone makes it out to be, or do you think it distracts us from the real issue, which is that the farmers, in terms of the economics of it, are just getting, you know, getting a raw deal? Yeah, that's an awesome, that's an awesome point, Kelsey. Because most problems that exist in Africa are they're poverty. The, the real po problem is poverty. And if you want to look at why there are ch children on farms, it's because of poverty. And until you solve the poverty, you're not really going to stop much in a sustainable way. So I think you hit the nail on the head. We see children all the time helping their parents on a farm, but no different than how people help their parents with chores around the house here. Um, I think it's West Africa, which is, again, that's the, the very bulk crop that's got a lot of price pressure on it, where there's more allegations and, you know, documented instances of child labor. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's the, the problem's poverty. And it, it was nuts. I could walk up to someone and say, hey, what, you know, what time is it, cocoa farmer? And they would say, we don't use child labor. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, and like it was just so present that... Yeah, that and, actually and, happened. Oh, oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, it would... Um, there was like uh, on sides of buildings there were drawings about how you're not supposed to use uh, child laborers, and you, but you saw kids working everywhere. So it was almost like this thing of like, okay, we have this cocoa, and it is going to uh, Westerners, and, the, and it'll be turned into chocolate. So this needs to be free of child labor, so they can eat their chocolate guilt-free. But everywhere else in our lives and our culture, it's okay for kids to work. 
And mm -hmm. a lot of times they didn't have access to school. Even if they could afford to go to school, are you going to send your, you know, eight-year-old to walk, you know, 15 kilometers through spitting cobra-infested jungle to, to, to get to the school? So, um, you know, that just seems kind of like this giant distraction there from the fact that the farmers were just not getting paid well at all. Yeah. Um, so there's uh, so you guys are direct trade. So the, the, how we got kind of connected and someone pointed me to you is um, we were talking about a fair trade, and anytime fair trade gets brought up, the conversation, uh, the alternative of direct trade gets brought up as well. So could you just explain what that is and the difference? Um, yeah, fair trade is uh, you're talking about the commodity price of cocoa and you want to make sure that the cocoa farmer receives a certain price for the cocoa and that that's at a fair market value. In other words, the farmer is not going to get ripped off. That doesn't mean that the people using the cocoa have ever met the cocoa farmer or it doesn't mean that they've ever met anyone who's ever met the cocoa farmer. There still could be six or seven steps of middlemen in between. So there's not there's some traceability on paper, but there's no traceability among humans. Mm -hmm. Direct trade is you're actually working directly with the farmers. The company using the chocolate and buying the cocoa is buying it directly from the farmers, which means imagine that the value chain has been compressed or the supply chain has been compressed. You eliminate about four to five layers of middlemen, and that means that basically you can afford to pay the farmer a higher price than even if it's just standard fair trade. Fair trade is um, I think a, a good first step when it started but I think people are starting to realize um, we can do a lot better. So with um, because you know one of the things that I've seen as I've written about this and um, you know, I had the opportunity to talk to all the different fair trade certification agencies. I believe you guys work with Fair for Life, correct? To as a kind of a third party certifier some. Yeah. So I'm interested to kind of hear how that works because it seems to me like that's kind of direct trade with with fair trade in it as well. But it seems to me like one of the things with direct trade as it becomes more popular and as it grows is like how is there this accountability? You know, how like you seem like a good guy, your company seems awesome. Uh, you guys' heart seem in the right place, but what about the, ne the next company that comes along that all of a sudden has a bad, you know, a bad year, and then maybe can't pay those farmers six times what they were paying them before? Like, how is that accountability and transparency? How can it be in place for direct trade? Yeah, I think you you broke up there a little bit. Can you just repeat the last twenty seconds? Okay. So, um, so for like a. Um, you know, fair trade, there is that third party accountability. So I look at direct trade, and as it grows, that becomes more popular. And like you guys seem to be doing really great stuff. What if there's another direct trade company that comes along and says that they're doing this great stuff as well? But how do we as consumers know that that is actually the case when there isn't like that third party certification? Yeah. Great question. And I don't think there's an easy answer, at least not an answer that someone would want to hear. I yeah. think I think it means that consumers are doing a little more research on their own and that they have to dig a little bit, not much. Um, but I think that's something my sense is that consumers like doing or want to do. Um, I think we're well beyond the age of you know where advertising can shape a customer's mindset and people want to be a little more independent and knowledgeable about the decisions they're making. Um, I think you can trust certain certifications like direct trade or fair trade, but you just have to be a little more skeptical than you have in the past. And think of it as any as you would any institution. So fair trade is enormous, mm -hmm. and the larger an institution gets, um, the more it changes compared to what it was initially set out to do. So anyway, I mean, fair trade's been criticized a lot in the press. I don't want to really get into that, um, but I think for the consumer, it just means you know tr trust your instincts. If 
there's a product you like, go to their website and um, you know see if it it makes sense to you. And if it does, it's usually good enough. Is there a direct trade certification of some kind? What was that? Is there a, a direct trade certification? There is. Yeah. Oh. Oh. So and who is that? What Fair for Life? Is that how you guys work with Fair for Life? Is that what they administer? Or? No, a Fair for Life is a fair trade certification. Okay. Uh, direct trade is a different certification. There's about four different agencies that can certify fair trade. They all have different logo, logos. I think that contributes to some of the confusion, actually. Yeah. So I know it seems like, because as I was calling different companies, it seems like Fair that Fair for Life had... Um, it left more uh, room for the for the cons the producer and then the person buying the product to work out that relationship. Is, is would that be a correct assessment for Fair for Life? I think Fair for Life has a very specific difference than Fair than other Fair Trade, which is um, they look at not just the um, Producers, they certify the entire value chain. So in our case, the producers are the cocoa farmers. Then there's a factory in Madagascar that produces the chocolate. And then there's us, the people who yeah. buy the cocoa. We all go through the process and become a fair for life company. So they're looking at how are people treated, not just at the farm level, but even within our own company. What do we pay people and what is the work environment like? To me, fair for life represents a kind of a more holistic way of looking at what the issue is. Um, does that make any sense? Yes, it does. Yep. Are you, how, where do you see the, you see the direct trade movement uh, growing? I mean, you are probably at the very beginning of it, or did it exist before? And, and where do you think it, that it's going? Yeah. I think it's going to grow. I think people are going to get more and more skeptical of larger certifications. And this isn't a chocolate thing. It's more of the way... Americans are starting to eat food. Um, if you think back to 40 or 50 years ago, it was really mass-produced, industrialized food that ran the country, or at least the, the food market or food economy. Now people, it's much more fragmented, and you can see like the explosion of green markets and the explosion of people wanting to buy locally made products, the explosion of organic. All that means is there, there used to be three chocolate companies, and now there's a hundred. Craft beer is another wonderful example. There used to be three or four large beer companies. Now every city in America has like 20 microbreweries. So there's more choice, and with that, um, there's more partnerships, and there's a lot, a lot more smaller companies. And the smaller companies are the ones who are able to go and establish direct relationships because they're basically buying on a smaller scale. So we're buying a relatively small amount of cocoa. Our company is set up so that it's very easy for us logistically to go buy a small amount of cocoa and only work with one group of farmers. Whereas if you're a huge company, you're never going to be able to go work with one group of farmers. You need to source your cocoa from tens of thousands of different farmers, and that's very cumbersome. So, so, anyway, direct, so direct trade is, is always going to be a... Um, like it's not going to scale to the size of Budweiser. It's always going to be smaller, like microbrew. Is that kind of is that a correct assessment? I think if if what we're talking about is people, companies who are buying their ingredients, cocoa or coffee or whatever, directly from farmers, which is direct trade, that's going to get more popular. Fair trade on the other side is much more of a kind of a larger institution that actually plays well for bigger companies. I got you. In many ways, it's the bigger companies like Hershey's that's you know, under a lot of criticism for their supply chain that need to have that fair trade label, whereas direct trade is much more entrepreneurial and more common for smaller companies. Mm -hmm. well, great. That's Because uh, I know that people get – and it, hopefully we clarified it for some folks because it is I – mean, there's so many different labels. I think there's like more than like 70 – Ethical labels. So, is is part of uh, part of what you all are trying to do too is connect the consumer to the ultimate 
producer, and how do you go about do doing that? Do you like share the stories of the farmers and the families, or do you not want to do that, or how does do you see it going more towards that? Yeah. Yeah, we haven't done a whole lot of that yet, um, visibly through video on our website, but we've started to, to get really serious behind the scenes about how we document who we're working with and what changes um, that they've had to their standard of living. We, we tend to like do the assessment first and then figure out the marketing piece later, but we do an annual study um, that looks at our cocoa farmers and their standard of living increase that's measured across a lot of different metrics from like total income to disposable income to what percentage of their income is now being derived from cocoa versus a control group. Um, so we're, we're, we're internally very interested in pursuing that information and we do that. Um, but we haven't yet you know, done video to put on our website and to show it. I think we're, as we grow, you know, we always have limits of what can we do at any one point in time because we're small. Yeah. As we grow, we're going to we are going to do more and more of that. And like you said, bridge. We want to bring people to Madagascar. We want to bring people in Madagascar to the U.S. We really want to make that connection in a, a nice, thoughtful way through a, a very delicious product. Um, but I think what most people don't understand in the chocolate world is, and these are just average people eating chocolate. They don't really understand that the people on the very beginning of that chocolate bar are living lives um, that are much, much different than how we live and, and go about life in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Well, anything else you'd like to add, or do you have any questions for me? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear a little bit more about why you went to Africa in the first place and um, you know, your, your first impressions from someone who's probably eaten chocolate your, your whole life, I'm presuming, but yeah, I really love to see what's what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, so um, you know, my first book was about the the global garment industry. So I went and hung out with garment workers around the world, and most of them were former farmers. And I remember I was at this dump in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, uh, the city, you know, the city dump. And I'm, I don't know if you've seen some of these dumps in every developing you know, nation, the major capital has them and like people live there, trash pickers looking for things of value and like this burning trash and there's kids like working there too earning 25 cents per day and it's just like the worst place I've ever been in my entire life. And as I'm going around there people told me that many of these people who work at this dump which is like hell on earth were former farmers. So I got to thinking like what is happening you know back on the farm and then you know, I, I got back and I became obsessed with labels and I started it in I think 2009 there was country of um, the USDA started requiring country of origin labeling on more food items so as a label watcher I started to notice like my mushrooms were from China which kind of you know, started to freak me out a little bit so um, I wanted to go and find out what was happening on the farm so that kind of led to the, the where am I eating a book project so I went to Costa Rica for bananas, Nicaragua for lobster China for apple juice, uh, Colombia for coffee, and um, Ivory Coast for cocoa. And I actually went with a guy that, uh, it, it, Tom Newhouse of Mama Ganesh Chocolate. I don't know if you've heard of them. It used to be Sweet Earth Chocolate. Mm -hmm. He runs something called Project Hope and Fairness. And he has been visiting West Africa for, I think, the better part of a decade now. Just going, sitting, and talking with cocoa farmers and learning about the challenges that they face, taking tools to them, and so like all the village chiefs know them. So it was a really good end for me because that I was kind of nervous, like you know, just to ro roll up and out into the countryside and just say, "Hey, tell me about your cocoa." You know, like what yeah. are you doing here? So um, you know, we would go into the different villages, and they knew we were coming, and he was bringing you know like machetes and boots and things like that and they would have a feast for us and we'd get bat and cane rat and all this you know, all this stuff fed to us um, but then I got to hang out with a lot of cocoa farmers as well and just sit and talk to them um, about their lives and the challenges that they face and see their homes and meet their kids and uh, a lot of you know a lot of their homes I'm sure probably aren't too different from what you saw I mean they, they were just like you know mud brick homes with no electricity no 
if you had I had to go to the bathroom and I had to go out back in the grassy area and hope there was no cobras out there. And this is their life. And you're sitting there talking with a guy, and he's got half his you know, bottom half of his leg. Uh, you know, part of it is missing because he got bit by a bit by a cobra. And that's just it. You know, that's just their life. And they want they were really hungry to learn more about how to um, be better farmers. Mm -hmm. And for me, not really knowing anything about cocoa farming or you know, other than what I had read in books. You know, out there in the field, I wasn't going to be very much used to. Here's what you need to do: this tree is way too close to this tree, and you need to make it rain more. Or you know, like I, I couldn't really help them out a whole lot like that. But just to see that they wanted that uh, assistance, and they were actually certified through uh, UTS, uh, UTZ. And are you familiar with that certification? I've seen it, but I don't know what it means. Yeah, uh, it's just like a kind of a you know, one of the ethical label certifications, and no one had ever visited their farm. They, you know, got paid really poorly. As the cocoa prices, which is one of the most volatile commodities in, you know, on, on, on Earth, uh, as it rises and falls, it makes a difference if they can, you know, eat meat or send their kids to school. Um, so that was just to see their lifestyles. And where the one farmer I met said that he would need to earn about three times more than he was currently earning to actually provide his family with the life he would like to provide them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he earned about $300 per year. Yeah. Um, I visited one cocoa farm where I wanted to work on the farm and, hold on one second. Oh, can I, I'm actually just, it's okay. Yeah, thanks. So, getting my windows washed. I guess I'll have to be dirty for a while. Uh, but I went to one cocoa farm and um, I wanted to work to feel what that's like because I don't know if you've ever held that cocoa pod and that machete, mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't know how good you are at it, but I am horrible. Yeah, it's like boom, like you know, they're just bam, bam. I'm just worried. I'm just going to do, you know, yeah, Luke Skywalker yeah. thing. Yeah. So, um, so I worked on, on the farm with this, and not I worked. I just kind of the whole village kind of walked around just to stare at me as I was out there, um, <laughs> you know, cutting open the cocoa pods. And but it turns out I struck up a conversation with a guy on this farm. His name was Solo, and he was from the neighboring country of Ghana, and he could act as my translator because the, their native language is English, and, and, and not their native language, but their um, official language is English in Ghana, and it was French and Ivory Coast, which I was you know, lost um, in that department. So uh, as we started striking up a conversation, he, uh, it became apparent that he'd been there for four months and hadn't been paid, that he uh, might get paid if he's there for another eight months which is not too uncommon of a situation. He asked to leave but wasn't allowed to leave. He told me that they that he gets treated worse to don than the donkeys because at least they get fed when they don't work. Um, told me that they do worse things to him than beat him. And he called the guy who he worked for, who also happened to be my guide, which was really awkward. He called him master. Hmm. And, um, you know, and it's... There's hundreds of thousands of people in Ghana and Ivory Coast who are in his situation, which by definition, according to the International Labor Organization, is a slave, you know? And, and just to see, to see him, but then also to see most of the farmers and to see how much they were struggling as well. But a lot of these farmers came, we come from Burkina Faso, come from Ghana to work on farms for the opportunity to maybe earn $300 uh, for, for the year and they may not earn anything. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, to watch like documentaries, like there's the dark side of chocolate, and to see how the wrong things get sensationalized, I feel, mm -hmm. where the child labor, like 0.5% of children in West Africa work uh, for a non-relative on a cocoa farm, mm -hmm. but that gets like 100% of our attention. Mm -hmm. And what doesn't get attention is the raw deal that the cocoa farmers are getting. Right. The fact that they're kind of forced to hire these forced adult laborers and that if they're trying to earn any money, they almost have to have that kind of semi-free labor. Not to absolve them of, of having slaves by any means, but the situation is much more complex than we like to make it out to be. Yeah. I agree. I think that's why you raised the point earlier um, that it's... Child labor is obviously very unfortunate, but the the issue is poverty, 
and that's what causes child labor. And until you solve for poverty for everybody that's farming cocoa, nothing that you do is going to last a long time. And that's why we've always been so insistent that treating the farmers well, paying farmers above fair trade, is kind of like the bar for entry. You shouldn't even consider getting involved in the chocolate business if you can't do that. But once you can do that, you got to start looking at the next step, which is making chocolate in the country. Mm -hmm. Because making chocolate in the country means that you're now creating jobs outside of the agriculture sector. Those are high-skilled jobs. Those are jobs that people need an education to perform. Those are the jobs that simply don't exist there. Not only like the jobs in a chocolate factory, but our packaging um, is all handmade in Madagascar mm -hmm. by female women. There's 10 people who derive their entire family's income from making wrappers for us. And you start to add all of this up, and it's very small, but it's, I think, quite symbolic in that that's the way forward. And if Africa as a continent would make a little more chocolate than they do today, they produce statistically the equivalent of 0% of the world's chocolate, mm. even though they grow up to 70% of the world's cocoa. So if they made a little more chocolate from that cocoa within their own borders, they'd create a lot of opportunity for people and you'd start to see poverty go down a little bit. So I don't know if you can answer this or not, if it's given away too much of your like your model, uh, but like a bar of uh, Madecas chocolate, mm -hmm. like what percentage of that stays, what percentage of that stays in the country, like the value of that? Yeah. Um, the, the cost to produce it, 50%. 50%, yeah. Mm. And I think the average in the industry is probably around 3 or 4%. Wow. Because it's just the cocoa. Yeah. But it's really the, it's the manufacturing, which requires a, a lot of the value, and then the packaging, and then the, all the other ingredients. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's where we've, we've said in the past, if you look at this model of making chocolate in the country, it's anywhere from five to ten times the economic impact that fair trade cocoa is because you're getting at the issue, you're getting out, outside of agriculture to uh, impact some different communities. So are there a lot of other um, companies like yourself getting into this direct trade model? Do you have a lot of competition out there? Do you see that it's really picking up? Or? Not really. Yeah. No. I think to do what we do takes a very unique mix of experiences we've had mm -hmm. and uh, even an interesting mix of philosophies. And, you know, in other words, you have to be a little bit crazy to do what we're doing, mm -hmm. to try and make chocolate start to finish in Africa. Um, and you've got to really be um, sure about why you're doing it. And if those two things don't line up, then, you know, it's unlikely that a lot of people are going to start doing this. I think what they they'll look for is a company that's been successful and to see that it can be done. Mm -hmm. It's never been done before. And we've seen other companies outside of the chocolate industry start to move towards a model where they're producing everything in country. Mm. Um, so there's, you know, a coffee company that we've helped in Nicaragua. There's a dry fruit company in East Africa that has come to us for advice where they're trying to not only harvest the coffee in Nicaragua, but dry, but roast mm. and package the, the beans mm. in Nicaragua. And the people doing fruit in East Africa, same thing, they're actually drying the fruit and adding the value locally in East Africa. So mm. I think we're starting to see things happen outside of the chocolate industry. Um, I'd say it's just a matter of time before someone else starts to make chocolate in Africa. But we have not seen a, like an explosion of yeah. So where can people find your chocolate on the shelves in the United States? Yeah, the chocolate's available uh, at every Whole Foods in the country, and you can also get it on our website. Those are the two easiest places to find it. So it seems like a, a very different model than most of the chocolate bars that sits right beside. Is that Would that be a correct assessment? That would be a correct assessment. So like, how do you try to, I mean, how can you just... I mean, that's a, that's a lot of pressure on that wrapper. I mean, right. 
<laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't envy you for that. So a lot of it is just getting your story out there, huh? And, and educating consumers about why that bar is a little bit different than the one sitting next to it. That's what it amounts to, one person at a time. And it's funny because our chocolate bar costs about four ninety nine, and the average chocolate bar is going to be two ninety nine or three ninety nine. And usually you're at a big disadvantage if your a product costs more than the average. Mm. But when we do encounter people and we have the time to walk them through a tasting or to tell a story, more often than not the response is, why is this only five dollars? Mm. And so mm. we know it's really just a question of getting a word out one person at a time. Mm. But um, we're not in a in an overly ambitious hurry. Because on the back end, doing all this work in Madagascar can only go so fast. Yeah. And um, one of our like company mottos is anything is possible in Africa if you're not in a hurry. Awesome. And I'm sure you you picked up on that from your time in Africa that it, it's not you know it's not a fast paced type of um, mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. Well, awesome. I've had you way longer than, than I asked to have you. So um, if you have any more questions for me, uh, answer them. Or if you'd like to you know, leave us with the last thought, uh, we can just wrap up. Yeah. No, thanks. Thanks for the time. Um, thanks for bringing you know, the issue to the front. And um, I still want people to enjoy every bar of chocolate they ever sink their teeth into, whether it's ours or Hershey's, but just to start understanding a little bit about what's going on um, behind the scenes and thank you for bringing that to people's attention. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks, Tim. It was great to meet you and uh, best of luck, man. Thanks, Kelsey. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.